Welcome to Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. I'm Dr. Dave Moylan, Schuylkill County Coroner and Medical Director for the Simon Kramer Cancer Institute here in New Philadelphia, Schuylkill County. And I'm so pleased to welcome back Dr. Cyril Wecht, who's with us visiting on, nice your, way, you, on your way up to uh, Connecticut. And thank you so much for uh, detouring to, to stop in here at the Institute. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of attending a very intriguing symposium out at uh, Duquesne, or as we say in Schuylkill County, Duquesne <laughs> University. Uh, no, it's a, a wonderful place out there. And we were uh, at a, a conference sponsored by the Cyril Wecht Institute for Forensic Science. And law. And, and law, and law, okay. And again, we, we didn't really talk about it in the first section, but having both an MD degree and a JD degree, that is a very rare combination in, um, in society, really. Yes, um, yes, if you just take the number of doctors and lawyers out there and then you do a proportional mathematic equation, you'll see I think the word rare probably could still be used. Uh, not as rare as it was back um, in the early 60s when I got my degree. Uh, you could uh, you know, almost count them on the fingers and toes of your hands and feet but uh, somewhat more. Uh, but th then the number who actually practice is even rarer. There are some, um, mostly some doctors who have gotten a law degree, they were interested and they just don't have time to do anything in law. Um, you won't find uh, among the MDJDs um, probably only 10, 15 percent are people who went to law school first and then medical school. Most went to medical school and then they get a law degree because of their, their interest in a whole bunch of things. The uh, Cyril H. Wecht Institute of Forensic Science and Law was established at Duquesne University. I was highly honored by the law school where I had been an adjunct uh, professor from 1962 and still am to this day. And so I knew the professors and the dean there, they were friends, and quite unexpectedly, they called and met with me and asked me if I would be interested in having this named after me and to develop programs then in that overall field. And uh, so we did, and uh, we continue to this day with annual conferences, um, with uh, uh, bi-weekly or monthly programs for lawyers on, in legal ethics, other medical legal programs. Then we um, <clears throat> interface uh, with forensic programs at Duquesne University in their schools of nursing and psychology, graduate school of health sciences, as well as the law school. Uh, so it's very active. My son, Ben Wick, is the executive program director, and he brings all of these wonderful programs together, and you've attended I, I uh, met some of ben them. Right. Uh, over the summer, we had yeah. some major programs and major players over the years. We had one of the first, first DNA national programs with Barry Sheck, who, along with Peter Neufeld, started the Cardozo Institute DNA program. Uh, we had um, um, one of the first major program on concussions when the whole be program began to develop on CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We had the heavyweights from Boston and uh, the Steelers doctor, neurosurgeon, who's a colleague of mine and my, uh, my son, who's a neurosurgeon. Um, and uh, we've had um, 40th and 50th anniversary programs of the JFK assassination with Senator Arlen Specter uh, and uh, uh, other people as well as that and one coming up next month is going to be on serial killers so we're very proud of the institute and its contributions uh, not only to duquesne but reaching out to other schools and programs uh, in the area as well as to people interested in forensic science and law from all over including some people from foreign countries well while we're on the topic of cte there is a um young football player now making some noise about what helmet he's able to wear. 
Oh yes, I well he's the former Steeler, Ant yes, Antonio Steeler. Brown, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah, he's well, he's he's. Uh, I, I I I saw that just today. Something about uh, a helmet that he, uh, he. Apparently, there was a grandfathering of these uh, older helmets, and there was a ten-year window, and then after the ten years, they uh, the NFL says no, you got to get the modern helmets, and uh, he was. He doesn't uh, want to give up his no, old. No, he helmet. doesn't want to give up his old helmet. So. Well, I can see that one both ways. If it's a helmet that he's used, yep. and I've seen him play dozens of times through the years for the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, I can see it from the standpoint of the team ownership in the NFL because of the technology that is now available and advanced um, <clears throat> instrumentation, uh, implementation of new helmets to prevent concussions, how they could be sued then yeah. if he does develop CTE. And, and then, well, the, uh, they would say, well, I, I, I didn't want to uh, change. And so it, uh, the, the, the NFL should have made you change. Yep. And you'd be looking well, I think at maybe a, a, a six-figure uh, settlement or verdict. Well, and in fact, there was um, news of a uh, famed football player that just died uh, recently and he was uh, suffering from uh, dementia, and he made a donation of his brain oh, yes. to this. Can you tell us a little yes. bit more of that? Because well, we hear it in the yeah. coroner's office all the time. Well, I'm very proud to mention that the CT thing started in my office when I was coroner. Dr. Bennett Omalu, uh, who had trained under me and who was then on my staff as a forensic pathologist, who didn't know the difference between football and baseball, he's from Nigeria, very bright. He became interested in this because he had a fascination for forensic neuropathology. And he's the one that deserves credit for developing the CTE. Um, uh, my name is on the first paper that was published. And uh, that flowed from there. We had the first uh, NFL a football player, Mike Webster, remember that? Yeah. And then we had others later on, Strelsik and, 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 and others, uh, and that evolved uh, into a major production, uh, leading, of course, to the movie Concussion, which I'm very proud of, having been portrayed in the movie by, by a wonderful, wonderful uh, actor. Who was that? Albert Brooks. Oh, yes. Uh, Albert Brooks um, portrays me in the movie. Um, um, Dr. Amalo is portrayed by Will Smith. Will Smith. And uh, that's where I had the pleasure of meeting Alec Baldwin, who portrays one of the neurosurgeons. He had dinner with my wife and me and his assistant because of his interest in JFK assassination, not because of the movie. And we had a delightful two hour and a half dinner, and we've remained uh, friends uh, since then. And he's come to Pittsburgh uh, for programs of, of ours. Uh, he has a fascination with the JFK case. So the CTE thing continues. We've got a lot to learn. As you know, as a um, uh, radiologist, uh, an oncological uh, radiologist in your specialty, that there are still things that we're trying to see if we can identify before uh, the person dies. We can't biopsy a brain or those areas of the brain like when biopsy a tumor in the liver or something in the lung. We can't do that. So we've got to find ways, and we're looking to you and your colleagues in radiology, I would say primarily, to come up with a technique that will be able to make that diagnosis in living people at the beginning of the disease, hopefully with some treatment that can be implemented. Well, along those lines, as you know, we're very active in the virtual autopsy yes. or post-mortem CAT scan. But That's going to be the answer. I think it, it, it could well, but one of the limitations is for brain tissue. Uh, the, the images that we see with the density measurements in a CAT scan are limited. And I think the future is going to be the MRI scanning. And that, I think that will be yes. the, the next step. Yes. But very often we have um, families come to us because dementia, uh, that's an epidemic, the dementia epidemic. And uh, is there any analysis, they'll ask the coroner, any analysis that uh, can be done uh, on these uh, brains? And there are, I know a couple universities are looking at it, but they're kind of like disease specific. Do you have well, any comments on that? Yes, people are willing their brains. Um, Dr. Uh, Cantu 
and Anne McKee in Boston, whom we had on our program back in Duquesne some years ago, uh, they're spearheads in this. There are other people who are doing this work too. And people are donating brains and they're studying them. And they're finding, of course, these uh, protein plaques, these tau bodies, T-A-U, tau bodies, um, which um, are diagnostic of um, this disease, CTE, also found then in other diseases of Alzheimer's and so on. And as you know, as a, an experienced physician and a radiologist, that as we sit here today, while there have been some advancements diagnostically, and while there have been some advancements therapeutically, um, these are matters that are just beginning to knock on the door. We sit here today and we know not much more today about multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and then other um, less well-known forms of dementia. We know not much more today than we did when I was in medical school and when you were in medical school. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, earlier today, I introduced you to one of our externs who's in a few days going off to Penn State but she's not only interested in criminology and uh, criminal justice, but also neuroscience. Good. So that what an exciting area. That's a era. very exciting field. I think we're going to take another commercial break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you about the three sluice. Welcome back to Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. So glad to have as our guest Dr. Cyril Weck from Pittsburgh, a world-renowned forensic pathologist. Cyril, Happy welcome to be back. Here, Dave. Thank welcome you. Back. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, we are in our last segment here, but I'd like to talk about a couple interesting uh, things. One is the opioid epidemic. We've been rocked and socked by that here in Schuylkill County. You know, we have limited resources. Uh, we talked about some of the uh, premier. Uh, toxicology labs, which one's in uh, Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, yes. NMS labs, and uh, we, and then the the need to work cl closely with law enforcement to take some of these cases to uh, court to see if we can get some convictions on the felony uh, crime of supplying controlled substances that result in death. What has been your experience out in the western part of our state? First of all. The opioid epidemic is <clears throat> nationwide, nationwide, um, no question about it. Uh, what I have seen, uh, even the changes from when I was Allegheny County Coroner, uh, 60s in the 70s, and then in the 90s into the early 2000s is phenomenal. Um, opioid uh, crisis um, is a misleading term in a way because other drugs um, that are very significant, including fentanyl, you know, are not technically speaking opioids. However, that's okay. We can, we know what we're talking about. Um, I, I have testified uh, at least um, a half a dozen times, maybe more, and have one or two scheduled already uh, of homicide cases involving people who supply drugs. The laws that are present now in every state and the federal law that you could even give somebody the drug. You don't have to sell it to them. You don't have to be a black marketeer. Uh, if you give the drug in some way um, and that person dies from that drug, you can be charged with homicide. And I've testified in those cases, many times having to do with multiple drugs being present at post-mortem and determining whether the drug that the defendant supplied is the drug that caused the death. Can you rule out the other drugs? That's, that gets a little uh, technical. But um, I want to um, add something to your comment about law enforcement, which of course is important. But uh, Dave, if we're ever going to see a change in our lifetimes, really, it's got to be much more than that, and it's got to be something that starts a lot earlier. My recommendation, if I were made the overall drug czar of the United States, I would start certainly um, even before high school, maybe seventh, eighth grade, with some drug education, just like we teach other things 
in science, touch upon some things, medical and so on. And then in high school, I would have some, uh, you know, they don't have to be full courses. They can be segments of, of a course. And then you pick it up as the child gets older. And then you have some courses which may be electives, but there would be mandated courses or segments of courses. And then in college, more. You've got to begin to educate people starting at an early age about drugs and how people learn uh, unwittingly, unknowingly uh, to become drug addicts. It's got to start early. Then you've got to educate doctors more about the uh, number and the quantity, the variegation of drugs that they are writing prescriptions for. And then you've got to certainly improve on law enforcement, especially with drugs coming in from foreign countries. Fentanyl comes mostly from China. Why can't we do something about that? So um, that's the story with the drug crisis. It is really an epidemic and it is a tremendous financial drain on communities. Your point is so well taken. And I think from my field, oncology, we have seen the beneficial effects of anti-smoking campaign. Yes. And there's been a, a slight, a slight downward trend sure. in, in male lung cancer. I was involved in cigarette cancer cases many times. In the 60s, I was consultant to one of the manufacturers. Um, they were beginning to recognize that smoking could cause lung cancer. And it's a very good analogy that you bring up about education of people on smoking and then rules too about when and where you can smoke yeah. and so on. It hasn't gotten rid of the problem, but has made a big dent in lung cancer. It's definitely, uh, we're seeing yep. a benefit. Yes. Well. Over the summer, I went out to the Wecht Institute and had a, a truly delightful evening uh, with a program that you starred in with uh, two equally delightful gentlemen called the Three Sleuths. What the heck is that? And what ever gave you the idea to come up with that? Some years ago, um, uh, back um, in the early uh, 2000s, um, somebody contacted me and suggested that we put together a program to be presented in Las Vegas at one of the major hotels on the strip there. They would invite in their heavy players and to entertain them, um, how's about, because it goes back to something we, you and I have talked about before, uh, the, uh, the attractiveness of forensic science, the fascination with it. So why, thought somebody, don't we do this? We'll invite these players in and we'll give them a, a, a half hour, an hour. Well, they got very teed off at us. Our first program, we wound up doing four when the people sat there for two hours and nobody left. They just wanted to hear about the cases. So the first three sleuths were my two highly respected professional colleagues and personal friends, Dr. Henry Lee, the renowned international criminalist, and Dr. Michael Bodden from New York City, medical examiner, forensic pathologist, former medical examiner. Then Michael dropped out and in his place came to be the top level trial attorney, Mark Garagos, who handled Michael Jackson case and, uh, and many, many uh, others uh, um, uh, um, uh, that I've worked with him on. So we did the next, uh, I think, three shows there. And then the one you attended in Pittsburgh, I got Henry and Mark to come back and we presented the three sleuths. And what we do is we take turns, each handling a major case. And then the others might interrupt, sometimes in a jocular fashion, sometimes uh, substantively uh, uh, and so on. And uh, back and forth, uh, there wasn't as much um, fooling around at the program in Duquesne, as there was out in in Duquesne, we would Las Vegas, out yeah. in Las Vegas, where we interrupted our, each other more often. But that was the three sleuth program. I wish that uh, I and Henry and Mark Ergos had the time to do this on a professional basis and just go from one city to another, because people would pay big money to see uh, this kind of a program. It, it's, it's fascinating. No, it was, it was because you think of all the cases that that the three of us have been involved in and to talk about them. And then the interaction with the audience, then I you, thought then was you know, uh, open it up delightful. to the audience, yes. And uh, I spoke to uh, Mark Garagos, who was uh, of Armenian extraction, yes. Yes. you know. And uh, 
of course, I've been following that story for the last, for my the, lifetime, the, the Armenian the Armenians, the genocide. Yeah. It seems yes, like it's the, an area the church, yeah. that he was uh, uh, very involved in that. Yes, in the, in the very strong for his ethnic group, very strong. A major uh, contributor in many ways. Well, and while we're on ethnicity, I wanted to point out that your um, heritage is both Lithuanian and Ukrainian. Yes, my mother is from Kiev, which at that time was Russia. Today, now a separate country, Ukraine. And my father was from Lithuania, Vilna, now called Vilnius. Um, they both came, they met in America. They didn't know each other. Um, both, I think, the late 1910s. And uh, they met then and got married. And uh, I was an only child. And, um, you know, regrettably, Dave, they, uh, they did not want to talk about those years. Yeah. They were not comfortable years for them as Jews in those countries. Um, and fascinatingly um, and surprisingly, uh, amazingly, I bet you uh, not one out of a thousand people knows this, not that it's a secret. I just learned of it recently that the current president and the current prime minister of Ukraine are both Jewish. Yeah, yeah, that came <laughs> so to my attention too. things change, but that's my heritage and I'm very proud of that. Um, and um, um, my wife and I, uh, we've been to Russia and we did not have an opportunity uh, to um, visit uh, Kiev. Uh, we talk about doing that as well as visiting uh, Vilnius and we're going to try to put that together, maybe treat ourselves the next year. Wonderful. Um, but again, pointing out Schuylkill County uh, is a melting pot yes. here, and there's many uh, because people, of the coal mines, those, right? Yes, uh, yeah. coal mines. People and, they yeah. came and and uh, and my God, how 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 hard they worked, and how bad they were treated, uh, how poorly paid. The company stores, right, and living in exactly. little shacks and so, and that's a whole story of itself. Yeah. Well, uh, we're I can't believe that the hour has gone so quickly, but I want to show our viewers how topical this program is and six hours ago on the website I did see that you were called upon to comment on the Jeffrey Epstein uh, yes. case and it reminds me of the famous scene from Casablanca when Claude Rains <laughs> is uh, going over things looking over the paperwork and and it was about Ugati we haven't decided whether he committed suicide or died trying to escape. Yes, yes. Could you tell, exactly, uh, share yeah, your yeah, thoughts right, here? Right, 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 right. I'm sure you've uh, been involved in death yes. in custody, death well, in custody. as we sit and talk today, we haven't seen uh, the official ruling yet, uh, but um, preliminary um, findings and comments from the medical examiner's office in New York City indicate that this was a suicide by hanging. So the things we got to learn is what pieces of material were present in that cell that were able to be used for hanging. They should not have been such material. Number two, um, what happened to the suicide watch that was supposedly in place, given that background. Number three, uh, how about trained, experienced guards, not somebody that complains of being overworked and tired and uh, not fully trained. And then uh, explain to us how come his cellmate, uh, a, an ex-cop, a muscular guy in jail as a prisoner was taken out of the cell the day before. Okay, put all of those together. I am waiting for the answers, waiting for those answers. You know, uh, Dave, you, you quote something uh, from I'm like Mark, Mark Twain at uh, one time and so on. I think, I think it was Shakespeare uh, who one of his plays uh, said uh, something rotten in the state of Denmark, right? And that's what we have here. Something very, very putrid that has to be explained. And I, 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 I would like to see and hope there will be full disclosure. Because even if it is a suicide, and I have no reason to believe that somebody got in there and killed him, although that hasn't been ruled out, uh, suffocation or ligature strangulation covered up then by ligature hanging of a suicidal nature. But let's say even if it is suicide, it was a suicide that was invited. It's a, like he was given a formal invitation uh, to 
to an inaugural ball. Uh, uh, you know, we, we know about your problems, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take care of your problems. We're going to remove suicide watch. We're going to get you trained. We're going to get you guards that are tired and overworked and not trained. We're going to remove your cellmate to, so that doesn't, somebody doesn't interfere uh, with you and so on. And we're not going to give you psychological care. That's the way we're going to treat you. Well, we should I, be embarrassed. I'm a, I'm a movie buff, so it, that harkens back to the uh, Godfather uh, scene with Frank Pantangeli. But I understand you have some favorite uh, movies. Something about bleach? Soaked in bleach Soaked on Kurt bleach. Cobain. Yeah. I am uh, prominently featured in a documentary yeah. on Kurt Cobain. And another documentary I recommend to people they can find it. It's called uh, Brother's Keeper. Four uh, um, brothers in upstate New York, one charged with the mercy killing of another. I testified for that and got him acquitted. That was a phony uh, case. And then I was a consultant to Oliver Stone in the movie JFK. Um, uh, and then portrayed by Albert Brooks in the concussion movie. So uh, I've had my limited amount of, uh, of Hollywood uh, fame, not enough to allow me to retire, nor enough to attract Sophia Loren uh, <laughs> to get rid of my Norwegian wife. Yeah. I, I haven't reached that point yet. Well, Cyril, again, <laughs> many, you. many thanks for joining thank us you. today. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I want to thank all you viewers from Schuylkill and Luzerne counties for spending this time with us and our distinguished guest, Dr. Cyril Wecht. Until next time, thank you again.